Hi, welcome back. So today we're going to be starting a new topic, our last topic for the class, which is sustainability in the local San Diego region. The first topic is water. And next week we'll be continuing with suburban sprawl, sprawl in general, automobility, and other patterns and trends we see in San Diego, as well as alternatives. Um, could we be doing things differently and can we achieve more sustainable outcomes in doing so? So one key issue in many classes, you will learn new stuff and that is hopefully true. Um, in this class, we also want to unlearn old stuff that's not true. Wisdom from 1824, Artemis Ward said, it ain't so much the things we don't know that get us into trouble, it's the things we do know that just ain't so. Uh, Mark Twain, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. And that's in relation to um, one reason water is for fighting over. California has undergone a long history of fighting over water. One big reason for that is because despite appearances, California doesn't really have much water. And so recall this major emphasis of the 1970s era in terms of environmental problems and sustainability. This is sort of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. Um, there's increasing worldwide concern over ecological destruction. And one result of this is this focus on what can individuals do? What can we do to solve our problems? How can I save the earth? Um, and we're all responsible, right? We all need to be committed and we are all responsible. <clears throat> Importantly, individual actions matter. Don't get me wrong, they do. We need to also pay attention to the structural and organizational factors. Um, by structural organizational, I mean policies, um, who are our elected officials, what types of decisions are made in terms of the environment, society, the economy, how are things structured in a way that affects us all. Who's making those decisions? Um, how is the system set up? This is what we also need to pay attention to. Usually the structural organizational factors are disproportionately more important than individual factors. They're also harder to see. Um, they're built into the way our culture and society works. And so we often sort of take them for granted. We don't really consciously think about them. Uh, they're harder to see, but generally far more important. And the question becomes with the shift towards this organizational view, not what can I do, um, but what can be done? What are things that can be done to stop organizations from harming the earth? And so we need to focus on the bigger picture in terms of environmental problems. Um, again, individual actions matter. Don't get me wrong. This is not the most important thing that needs to be addressed. Um, and so how do we impact the natural world, our environments, uh, through ourselves and our own activities, so as individuals, but also not just individually, also how do we affect and impact our environments through organizations, through structural factors, through the way our societies are set up. To understand sustainability issues and the problems and potential solutions we face, we need to emphasize this connection between our resources and our discourses. So what is a discourse? A discourse is the way we talk about a certain issue and therefore the way we think about it. Um, so discourse, sort of the conversation surrounding an issue. Um, how is it talked about? How is it understood in the society? And in turn, how does this thinking influence our behaviors, our actions? The way that you see the world, the way all of us see the world, it's framed, it's informed by culture. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. And we often take this for granted. We don't question our own assumptions about the way the world works. And these take it for granted assumptions about what is nature, right? Many people assume nature exists separate from humans. We looked at this assumption. It's a cultural assumption. Um, how do these assumptions underlie the way we talk about and thus think about issues. And again, they're powerful. These taken for granted assumptions, they're often not conscious to it. They're often invisible or subconscious to us um, because it's part of our ideology, our understanding of the world. Uh, it's not readily apparent to us that, it, that our thinking is being influenced by it. Um, that's sort of the definition of an assumption, right? 
And so we have all these assumptions built into our discourse, into the way we talk about environmental issues. And the result is, uh, depending on the discourse, the way you frame the issue, people come up with very different ideas of what our problems are and therefore what our solutions might be. In sustainability, in this country, there are two powerful discourses that surround the way we talk about and think about sustainability. And also these two discourses possibly preclude more sustainable outcomes. And so that first discourse is this fiction of proportionality. Um, this idea that we are all as individuals equally responsible for environmental problems. And the implication is nothing can really happen or change until everyone changes. This is fiction. Um, I'll argue right now, we are not all equally responsible for environmental problems and certain specific changes are possibly much more important than everyone changing as individuals. One powerful discourse surrounding sustainability. And the second discourse is this notion, this discussion, this assumption that sustainability, a move towards solving our environmental problems or you, more sustainable resource use, et cetera, that any sort of environmental actions will result in economic harm, um, especially job loss. And you hear certain politicians on one side, particularly one side of the aisle more than other, talk about this all the time, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna threaten American livelihoods, you know, to save a couple of trees. And so the discourse is that actions towards sustainable interaction with our environment, like um, shifting to renewable energy or um, less reliance on fossil fuels, um, get, not using coal. These are touted as not yet doable, right? We, we're gonna put thousands and thousands of people out of work and therefore um, we can't do this. And something to keep in mind is, is this actually true? And what type of empirical evidence actually supports this? I mean, I think the other argument could be made that a move towards sustainability could create jobs, not create a job loss, um, right? So is this actually based in empiricism? And how many people are, are doing really well with the economy as it is right now anyways, right? And so this is an, another powerful discourse um, that any, anything done for the environment will have adverse effects on the economy. Um, Marco Rubio, Republican leader, I am not going to destroy the economy, um, it, talking about in relation to climate change. Okay, so what is the annual average rainfall in San Diego, tropical, beautiful, beach ridden San Diego? Uh, is it three inches, 10 inches, 17 inches, 38 inches, or 62 inches? And just go ahead and think about that for a minute, take a stab at it. Um, and the answer is B, roughly 10 inches a year. Um, it depends on any given year. It's been below 10 inches a few years ago. It was at 9.9, .9, um, sometimes as high as 12 inches. But right around 10 inches is how much rainfall San Diego gets per year. Um, it's, it's practically a desert. And this is what Reisner in the reading for today talks about, um, the American Southwest, a semi-desert going on desert. Do you know what, how much rainfall the desert gets? Um, for example, Nevada, where I'm from, Northern Nevada, dry ass desert looks like this. Um, they get about 10 inches a year too, right? The same amount of rainfall that San Diego gets. Another question, what percentage of San Diego water comes from local supplies? 20%, uh, 35%, 60% of the water we use in San Diego is locally supplied, 80% or almost all of it. Um, think about that, take a stab at it. And the answer is 20%, only about 20% of San Diego's water comes from local supply. The other 80% of San Diego County's water is imported from other areas. Uh, specifically, 30% of it comes from the Bay Area as part of the state water project. We'll discuss more in a moment. And the other 50% of it for San Diego comes from the Colorado River. Um, only about 20% of the water we use comes from local supplies and local conservation. Another thing located in California is the Central Valley, sort of in the middle of the map of California there. And uh, Central Valley, notice where it's located, sort of situated between the Bay Area and Southern California. 
This is a key agricultural region, possibly the most productive agricultural region um, in the world. And so how, how did it become the most productive agricultural region in the world? Um, and one answer to this is we took water from other areas to support agriculture in the Central Valley. Uh, and so there's a long history of water wars and fighting over water rights in the American Southwest, especially California. Reisner's Cadillac Desert, which you read the intro chapter for today, sort of traces the history of water management and policy in the Southwest. And he says the outlook is bleak. We live in a desert and the water that has allowed us to turn the American Southwest into this partially inhabited region with a green area about the size of Missouri, this water that has allowed us to do that is starting to dry up. And Reisner in the article, he sort of talks about flying over in an airplane over the American Southwest and you go about 10 minutes in between actual settlements, right? There's a little dot of lights, a little city, then you go for 10, 20 minutes and there's nothing and then there's another little city. Um, um, compared to the East Coast, it's fairly sparsely inhabited, right? We, I mean, we have major urban centers, um, but again, it's it's not populated in the densely way the East Coast is. And one of the reasons for that, again, is water resources. Um, the film Chinatown, Jack Nicholson is in it. It's a 1974 film that also goes over the historical disputes of water rights. Um, and it basically what it gets into is um, in the early sort of turn of the turn of the 20th century, sort of late 1800s, early 1900s, L.A. Um, was running out of water. And the mayor of L.A. realized that they could get water from Owens Valley and sort of siphon it down to L.A. And so Chinatown is about fighting over this, um, basically a fight between ranchers and farmers in Owens Valley and residents of L.A. Um, over who gets to use the water in Owens Valley. And so what's in Owens Valley? Uh, water. During the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, L LA had outstripped its water supply, wanted to bring water from Owens Valley to supply LA. Uh, there was lots of disputes and fighting over it. Ultimately, LA won out. And in 1913, the California aqueduct was constructed, only cost like 23 million dollars, which is, that's not a lot, right? Um, it's 223 miles long. Um, the total construction, again, less than 23 million. Uh, and this is, this brought water from Owens Valley to LA. Um, and it's basically one giant siphon, um, very little pumping involved. And you can see that pictured here on the slide. Here's one other picture for you. Um, look at that transfer of water um, straight through the desert, essentially. Um, and here on the slide on the map, you can see where Owens Valley is sort of um, on the top, more towards the top of the picture. Um, and then in blue is the L.A. aqueduct, which brings water from Owens Valley down to the L.A. region outlined in red. Um, and this is the first major import of water into the L.A. region. This is what Owens Lake Bed looks like now. This is an astronaut photo, actually, of the dry lake bed that used to be Owens Lake. And by the 1920s, this is only seven years after the dam, or excuse me, the siphon was built, the water transfer was done. In the 1920s, so much water was being diverted from the lake uh, that agriculture became difficult in in region, other regions of California. Um, by 1926, the lake was dry. Um, and since this time, since 1926, LA's water needs have only grown. Um, and so what are the recommended solutions to the water problem? Well, they're the same as they were about 100 years ago. Um, more water transfers. Um, this is the dominant suggestion. Do more of what we're already doing that kind of isn't working, right? Bring water from other areas to areas with need. Um, if you look and read the article, the Department of Water Resources projects significant future year water shortages in the state. Unless actions are taken to increase supplies, reduce demand, or manage the use of water resources better. Water transfers from one party with extra water to another party with temporary or ongoing needs are one potential management tool to address water needs. Um, so what water transfers from areas with extra water, whatever the fuck that means, to areas with identifiable needs, whatever needs is defined as, 
right? Um, I mean, currently right now, Las Vegas in Nevada is um, legally trying to get access to water in northern Nevada. Does the desert of Las Vegas need northern Nevada's water so they can shoot it up hundreds of feet into the sky as part of their casinos? I mean, needs um, from areas with extra water. What are we what are we doing? Right. And so these are still the recommended solutions. I just showed you that picture of Owens Lake bed. Right. This is the result of water transfers. And again, as Riser suggests, we're starting to sort of run out um, the much of the water that we get from the Colorado River. Do you ever notice how salty water tastes here in California if you drink out of the tap or like, for example, the ice in my freezer has salt outside of it. Right. That's how much salt um, is in the water because. By the time it's gotten here, it's left the river, picked up salinity and sediments from other areas and irrigation and been added back into the river. And it's carried hundreds of miles from Colorado. By the time it gets here, it's full of salt. And that's why water served with lemon here um, to try to get rid of that taste. There's even articles of antidepressant drugs um, in high enough concentrations to affect people ending up in California's water um, because of the water transfers and being taken from Colorado. Owens Valley supplies about 37% of LA's water. So almost 40% of LA's water comes from Owens Valley. You remember by the 1920s, Owens Lake bed was dry. Um, the other 51% of LA's water comes from California state water. Uh, and you can see this here on the, on the graph, on the chart. Some comes from groundwater, a little bit from recycled water. The 51% of LA's water that comes from state water, do you know where California state water comes from? It comes from the Bay Area and the Colorado River, right? About 50% from the Colorado River. Water is traveling very, very far to get to its ultimate destination. On top of water use, state water, transferring this water from the Bay and Colorado down to LA, among other areas, this is also the biggest user of energy in the state of California. Um, specifically, about 5 billion kilowatt hours per year are used just on moving the water. For a quick comparison, a 60 watt light bulb turned on for 100 hours uses 6 kilowatt hours. Um, the water transfer per year uses 5 billion kilowatt hours. This is equivalent, the energy it takes to move water um, in this example of transfer is equivalent to about half a million households energy use for the entire year. Here are photos of the man-made aqueducts and rivers that carry water to Southern California. And also note, look how these are made. Look how much evaporation is allowed to occur. Part of the reason is most the people using, we're not really paying for the water. If we had to actually pay the full cost of using this water, maybe we would design the transfers a little bit different, a little less wastefully. And beyond implications for sustainable water use, um, are, when are we going to run out? Will we have enough in LA and in California? The way that we manipulate water in this state to serve a handful of urban centers, by using water sources throughout half the country, this has also had effects on California's ecology and native species. And today is the day, and maybe the last day, I will talk about the Delta smelt. Um, and so there's a controversy going on right now over the state water project because it's essentially driving this species, the Delta smelt, into extinction. So the Delta smelt, it's pictured on the slide, this slender, small bodied fish. It's only about three inches long. And the fish, the smelt, is endemic to the San Sacramento San Joaquin estuary of California. Um, again, that's where we have a major area for water withdrawal for irrigation. We'll see it in just a sec. And so the smelt inhabits sort of the fresh water, salt water mixing zones of the estuary. Um, so this is, they're endemic to the area. The smelt also has really low reproductive rates. It has very low fecundity. It has just a one year life cycle and low reproductive rates. Um, so it's not a high reproducing species. It's also very susceptible to changes in the environment. And so recently, in recent years, there's been a documented drop in the smelt fish population over the past decades. And it's directly related, many would argue, to irrigation withdrawal for in the Central Valley. 
so the controversy is essentially over, you know, saving the fish versus um, continuing to use water the way we are for agriculture. And it's not just about the extinction of the Delta smelt, which is today essentially um, efforts are, are ongoing uh, in terms of repopulating the smelt, but it's essentially extinct in nature. Um, it's human efforts that are, are keeping it sort of populated in its natural environment. Um, and so there's a big fight over what to do. And it's not just about the smelt, right? Um, you know, again, the World Wildlife Fund doesn't have a big picture of a Delta smelt on it to get you to contribute to conservation funds. It's got pandas and elephants and the stuff we all like. Um, but the smelt is important to the overall ecology. It's what we call an indicator species, meaning if something is wrong going on with the smelt population, this is an indicator that there's problems in other areas of the ecosystem. Um, and if you start changing one part of the ecosystem, that can have a cascade of effects on other parts. So we're messing with the ecology of California. This is a, a close up of the Sacramento San Joaquin estuary, the Delta. And it is here that an artificial reserve has been created, Clifton Court for Bay. Um, and so water is collected here and this artificial reservoir was created uh, in 1969. They inundated like 2200 acre area um, and created this intake point as part of the California State Water Project. And so what happens is um, the water gets sucked in through this intake point and there's these vibrating screens um, at, at the pump and the smelt aren't strong swimmers. And so they get very easily sucked in to the pumps and killed in the vibrating screens. Um, so again, you know, who cares about the smelt? We care about pandas and elephants. Well, if conservation sustainability is actually about maintaining our resource base, we should all care about the Delta smelt, right? They're an indicator species. And we have water problems, not just in the Sacramento Delta, um, but pretty much across the board in terms of where California gets their water from. And so on the slide is pictures of different major dams, um, which create the reservoirs, which we get our water from. And we'll focus on just two, Lake Mead and uh, Lake Powell over here. So Lake Mead, here's just a picture for you, has over the past several years continued to drop to nor new historic lows. Um, and you can sort of see the, the past water level by the, the so-called bathtub ring on the rocks on the land. You can see how far the water has dropped. Um, this is an article from 2015. Um, look into it if you're interested. We're not going to talk about it. But it just shows that the picture has gotten worse, right? Things are just getting worse. Um, Lake Mead. Sort of more pictures of the same thing. Um, you can just again see how far the water level has dropped, different illustrations of that. Um, and I just pulled through this one in today, um, just another example again of how far the water level has dropped. And here, same thing um, on the top left, you can see how the water level at the dam, see how far that has dropped down. Um, on sort of the right side of the slide, it shows the extent of the water body of water um, from 1985 on the left to 2010 on the right it's like less than half the size and then that picture on the bottom there look at where the water is and i don't know how well you could see it there's two people sort of standing up in a canoe um, just to give you an idea of the scale of how much it's fallen that's lake mead and lake powell is pretty much just as bad uh, on the top, you can see the declining extent of the lake, of the reservoir, and then on the bottom, that's millions of acre feet um, and the lake volume, so how much water is in the lake. Um, you can see it declining from 2000 to 2004 or 5, and it goes up slightly, but essentially um, from 2000 to 2007, that time period on the graph, uh, Lake Powell's water volume has dropped by more than half. And we don't have problems just in terms of the level on top of the lakes, but also underneath the water as well. So again, the two main reservoirs that feed California's water needs are Lake Mead and also Lake Powell. Lake Mead is the biggest reservoir in North America, and it is currently 48% empty, um, half as full as it was when we started filling it up, if you will. 
On top of that, 15% of it has also filled up with silt. So when we say there's problems under the water too, it's not just that overall lake levels are dropping, but the bottoms of the reservoirs are rising as well due to increasing sediment buildup. Um, so when we say Lake Mead is half empty, it's actually more like 65% empty um, when you account for the sediment buildup underneath in addition to the dropping surface levels. And Lake Powell, um, again, pretty much just about as bad. And so what are we going to do? How do we solve our mounting water problems, our water shortage? Um, who's going to save the day? The answer to the question of who is going to save the day is you. Go ahead, pause the lecture and play this clip. The, the, you can either type in the URL from the slide or I've also pasted it in the description of this YouTube video. So just copy and paste it from there and watch it. It's like 30 seconds. Go ahead and watch it and come back and join the lecture. So hopefully you watch the clip. Who's gonna save the day? You, we are, individuals. Each acting responsible, responsibly on our own, we can solve our problems, right? And this is the typical Default. This is the go to. This is what we hear. This is what our government officials tell us. This is what people tell us. This is what those signs on the freeway telling us we're in a drought tell us. Use less water, save, reduce, reuse. Um, who's going to save the day? Who's going to be a water saving hero? You are, right? Turn the water off when you brush your teeth. Get rid of your lawn. Take shorter showers. Drive a hybrid. Do this, do that. You, you, you. And again, this is referred to as the default, the individualization of responsibility. You are going to fix our problems. We'll come back to that in just a minute. And it's not just sort of public relations announcements like this. Right? Our le elected officials, our leadership tells us this too. Um, this is 2010, I want to say, um, the San Diego article, the LA ones, 2009. And so just both examples of officials focusing on individual water consumers using less. Residents need to use less. Mayor Jerry Sanders in the article says, San Diego residents cut their water use by 11% during 2010, exceeding the goal of 8%. Quote, a year ago, I urged all San Diegans to make water conservation a conscious part of their everyday lives. Sanders said, they've clearly listened, unquote. A lot of good it's done. Okay, this was 2010. This is 2012. Lake Mead sinks to a new historic low in the text. Lake Mead sank to its lowest level in nearly 75 years on Sunday. A stark reminder of how drought and growing water demands have sapped Colorado River and its huge uh, reservoirs. Not since it was first filling in 1937 has Lake Mead held so little water. The reservoir's level fell to the historic low shortly before noon Sunday, eclipsing a previous record from the drought-stricken 1950s. And so we used less water the year before. Our reservoirs continue to shrink. Maybe we're missing a larger part of the problem. This is 2014. Um, a note on the extreme drought going on at that time. Um, so at the time, uh, 2014, these clips are taken from a San Francisco newspaper. Um, it was the most severe drought California has yet to go through. It definitely won't be the last or the most severe. Um, and so Governor Brown at the time called on Californians to reduce their water usage. I'm just going to read a couple of the excerpts. Brown committed to using his executive powers to steer water where it's most needed. He directed state agencies to immediately scale back water consumption, dot, dot, dot. Perhaps more importantly, the governor called on Californians to voluntarily reduce their water use by 20 percent, dot, dot, dot. One of the most important things that you have to have happen is that people need to use less water. And so notice how briefly they mentioned state agencies or larger, larger organizations needing to scale back. But the main focus is where? Where will the most important impact be? Individuals, people, Californians. The picture gets even worse if you start looking at future trends. Um, and so our reservoirs continue to shrink despite the fact that people are actually using less water as individuals. Um, what you're seeing here is April to July runoff, um, water runoff, essentially from the Sierra Nevada snowpack. 
That's what you're looking at. And so the decline in water runoff indicates a decline in snowpack. We're getting less precipitation each year as snow. One reason for that is climate change. This is problematic for several reasons. With the snowpack, snow melts slowly over the spring and summer months, and that slowly feeds the, the freshwater rivers and reservoirs that supply much of our water in California. Um, when you get rain instead of snow, climate change, you don't have a snowpack that's trapped and captured all this water um, in frozen snow that it then slowly is released over the spring and summer. Um, the rain can't be captured like that, right? It runs off, it evaporates. Well, I grew up in the Sierra Nevadas, I'm from Reno, Nevada, and when I was a kid, we used to have snow days. I mean, you, it would snow down in the valley, you couldn't walk out your front door, the snow was four feet high um, up to your front door. And this just doesn't happen anymore, right? And I, so I've seen this change just in my lifetime. I'm not that fucking old. Um, the snowpack just isn't there. And the snowpacks are really important part of what continues to feed our water resources that we rely on. So deeper implications and problems with this, rivers and reservoirs are considered renewable as long as the snowpack continues to feed them. These freshwater sources satisfy about 60% of California's water demands. Of the rest, the other 40% of what we use comes from underground water. And underground water is not renewable. It's like oil in this sense. It's not renewable in our lifetime. It's sort of lying in these large pools underground. When it's gone, it's gone. Um, there's You can look up pictures, actually, of irrigation withdrawal in the Central Valley leading to... Um, What's the word I want? The land has sunk. They've pulled so much groundwater out that there's like there's a pole that shows where the, the surface, the land was in like 50 years ago. And that marker is like 40 feet above the ground now. That's how much the ground has has sunk because of irrigation withdrawal, um, groundwater withdrawal. There was recently a few years ago an article published uh, in uh, affiliated with University of Nevada, Reno. They directly connected seismic activity, earthquakes, okay, in the Sierra Nevada to irrigation withdrawal in Central Valley. And we, that's how much water we are pulling out. And so it's not renewable. Um, the first dam was built in the early 1900s to alleviate this depleting groundwater problem. So in, by the 1930s, groundwater was being ex overexploited by farmers in the San Joaquin and Sacramento Valley, the Central Valley. And so in response, the government built dams. Um, the Central Valley Dam Project was the most expansive and expensive public works project in history up till that point. Um, largest public works project since the Great Wall of China, right? The, this dam in the Central Valley. Um, and so what was the result? The result was to, to build the dam to alleviate the need to use groundwater. You can now use the reservoir. Well, the result was instead of alleviating the groundwater problem, the dams actually allowed farmers to exploit even more land. They now had access to more water uh, more, more readily. And so they planted even, even larger amounts of land um, using both the water from the dam and still using the groundwater. And so the effect was to exacerbate the groundwater problem rather than alleviate it. Um, the dams allowed farmers to exploit even more land, thus needing even more water, made the groundwater exploitation problem worse, um, not better. And just note, recall our IPAT equation, right? Human impact on the environment is a result of several things, population, affluence, meaning consumption, and also technology. Technology can help alleviate human impact on the environment. It can mitigate it, um, lessen it. But it depends on everything else as well. And so the dam, in this sense, the new technology could have alleviated the groundwater problem, um, but instead it was used to grow on even more land, thus putting even more pressure on groundwater. So in this case, the change in technology actually exacerbated human impact on the environment. Remember, that can go one way or the other. It depends on the consumption behavior. And so Western U.S. water choices. How do we decide to use water here in the American Southwest? And Reisner in Cadillac Desert talks about this is a country of illusion. 
illusion, meaning it's not as it appears. San Diego is not as tropical as it appears. It looks tropical. There's palm trees all over the place. Do you know palm trees are not actually native to here? Only one species of palm tree is native to California. All the rest, um, right, the symbolic of the California skyline, palm trees are imported. They're not actually from here. And so this image of this tropical oasis here can actually be attributed to these feats of engineering, the building of dams and other water projects that have effectively turned a semi-desert into what you see today. It's really a semi-desert going on a desert, um, but it doesn't look like one. So too often our choices are based off misreading this idea, this mirage that things aren't actually as they appear. It looks lush and tropical. It looks like we have water, but we don't. That's because of technology and other things we've done to get water over here. And those sources are starting to dry up. So too, too often our choices are ba based off this mirage, this illusion, this misunderstanding of our situation, but also our choices and by our choices, I mean the choices, the decisions and policies that get made. They're often based off a lot of misleading as well, meaning that decision and policymakers aren't transparent about what our water policy is and who actually is using and benefiting from the water use. Um, and, and essentially where we're going with the misreading is uh, people aren't really paying the true cost of the water they're using. And this incentivizes them to not conserve it, right? Because they're not really paying for it. Uh, we'll get more into that here shortly. So let's talk about bottled water for a moment um, to kind of do a price comparison and to highlight a few other interesting things. So this is a picture of Fiji bottled water. By the way, I've been to Fiji and if you're in Fiji, um, you can buy this water for much cheaper than they sell it to you for in the United States. Um, and so this is a hotel bottle of water, which of course is always overpriced, right? They know that you're maybe hungover and desperate for a drink of water, so they'll charge you, you know, $27 for a little eight ounce bottle of water. This is $7 for a liter of water in the hotel room. Okay, um, five reasons not to drink bottled water. It's expensive, wasteful, and contrary to popular belief, it's not any healthier for you than tap water. It's actually usually dirtier than tap water. Um, that taste, that clean taste is probably bacteria, right? Rather than the chemicals and whatnot put into city water to sort of clean, purify it. Um, so we're gonna look at sort of several different aspects of bottled water. First, a cost comparison. So $7 per liter in a hotel, obviously way overpriced. Um, so usually about $3 will get you a liter in a store. And I realize you can get cheaper deals, you can get more expensive deals, but figure you go to 7-Eleven, grab a, a liter of smart water or something like that, you're paying three bucks. This works out in stores to about $11 per gallon. Um, so that's what we pay, it's pretty pricey bottled water, right? And real quick, quick question. What does it cost companies that make bottled water? What, in terms of just the water, what do they pay for the water that they're bottling for us? How do they get it? What do they pay for it? The answer is nothing in most cases. Um, they just go in to cities, towns, areas with fresh water and take it. They pump their trucks full and take it because in many cases, there's no regulation or rules preventing them from doing that. There's no law that says they can't, so they do. Um, excellent documentary about this called Tapped. It's about bottled water companies and where, where they get the water, which and again, it's, it's free. They just take it and then they sell it to us. <laughs> Um, okay, so $11 per gallon in a store. Let's look at the cost of city water. What do we pay as residents, um, you know, using water in our homes? Um, and so the residential rates are based off, these, I calculated this a few years ago, um, the picture is the same. It's based off the base rate you pay and then also um, the change in fees as you move up in tiers. So if you use um, over a certain amount of water, um, the price changes, like you have to pay a little bit more if you go over a certain amount. Um, there's these different tiers. Anyways, don't worry about it. That's, it's based off what you pay. Okay, so in San Diego, for about 70 bucks, 70, 95, we'll get you 12,000 gallons. And so this works out to 0 0.006 cents per gallon. Um, so remember in a store, $11 will get you a gallon of bottled water. In San Diego, per residential rates, we pay 
less than a cent per gallon. Um, in Phoenix, same idea, residential rates. You can get 12,000 gallons for $34.29. Uh, in Las Vegas, you can get 12,000 gallons for about $32. And also, it's kind of interesting to note Phoenix and Las Vegas are cheaper in terms of water than San Diego. Um, in Santa Fe, for 12,000 gallons, you will pay about 121 bucks. This works out to about, in Santa Fe, one cent per gallon for residential water. Okay, so the cost of bottled water is roughly $11 per gallon. Um, $11 will get you a gallon in the store. $11 will get you 11,000 gallons in Santa Fe. And $11 will get you about 1,800 gallons in San Diego residential rates. Um, and so what you're seeing is bottled water costs like 1,000 to 2,000 times as much as what we pay for water out of the tap. So why buy bottled water? Um, the caption says U.S. sales of bottled water grew steadily for three decades until peaking in 2007 at 8.8 .8 billion gallons or 29 gallons per person. Um, over the past two years, sales have tapered off. And so this again, this looks at um, pre-2000 and then up until sort of 2010. Sales started tapering in 2008, 2009. Um, Probably not because of environmental activism, probably because of the economic recession of 2008. Right? People had less money, they're buying less bottled water. And so why buy bottled water? It's not cheaper, as I just showed you. Um, it's not safer. The, if you think it tastes better, again, that might be the bacteria in there you're tasting um, because bottled water is not usually regulated. Um, it doesn't actually have to be safe or clean, uh, depending on what state you're buying it in. And so if you look at the graph, we sold 8.8 .8 billion liters consumed in 2008. So we're selling lots and lots of bottled water. And the result of this is all these plastic bottles. Um, we use, and the, if you're interested, the source is provided for you, 17 million barrels of oil per year in the U.S. just to make water bottles, just to make the water bottles. 17 million barrels of oil per year in the U.S. That amount of oil to make plastic water bottles is enough to fuel about a million U.S. cars per year. And then what about recycling? What's happening to all these bottles? Uh, 13 billion of the bottles that were sold in 2002 were thrown away. That is enough to reach the moon five to six times, the moon and back five to six times. That is enough plastic bottles to encircle the earth 53 times. That is in one year, just the bottles that are thrown out, not including the ones that are recycled. Um, and consumption has really only gone up since 2002. Um, safety, as I was saying, bottled water is not really any healthier or safer for you. And so the National Resource Defense Council, the federal government, actually did a study of this. They tested bottled water safety. It was a four year long study. They tested over a thousand bottles, looked at 103 different brands. And what did they find? They found that 30 percent, a third of the bottled water contained contamination levels, things like synthetic organic chemicals, bacteria, arsenic, which is a poison. Um, these levels exceeded state and industry standards. Um, what are government standards on bottled water anyways? Actually, the Food and Drug Administration exempts water that's packed and sold in the same state. And so this includes about 60 to 70 percent of all the bottled water sold in the U.S. Um, this leaves it up to the state since the federal government doesn't test. California luckily does regulate. It does test bottled water. But one in five, over 20 percent of the states in this country don't regulate it at all. Um, also, another issue is that state regulations on bottled water aren't as stringent as they are on tap water. So, for example, when testing for bacteria, um, bottled water is tested like four times a month. City water is tested hundreds of different times a month. Right. That taste, again, that people talk about when they say they like bottled water more than tap water. It's probably that bacteria right, that you're getting rather than the chemicals that are put into purify city or tap water. And despite increased advertising, recycling is 
down from a study from 1994 to 2003 of all the plastic bottles from this time period. In 1994, over half of them were being recycled, about 53 percent. By 2003, only 19% were being recycled. Of plastic water bottles, only about 12% of them were recycled. Um, that's 40 million bottles a day in the trash. Seven out of eight bottles just thrown away, again, despite increased advertising for recycling. And so what's wrong with this description of the water problem? As I've described it to you, people are using water, they're drinking more, they're buying more, um, and they're not recycling. What are you thinking? Um, we need people to recycle more. This is usually the go-to. How do we address this? Get people to recycle or advertise it. Or if that's not working, incentivize it. Hey, start taxing people that don't recycle. Um, make the incentives to be environmental friendly rather than to throw it out. Um, and so typically, if you sort of talk about this, the go to the default is we need to recycle more um, without even thinking about it. Right. The individual is highlighted. This is the typical approach to sustainability. The focus without even having to say it for most people is individuals. Oh, we have too much plastic. People should recycle. Oh, people drive too much. They should drive less. They should drive a hybrid. They should take public transit because taking public transit is so fucking easy around here. Um, and the focus is individuals without even having to say it. This is what we call the default framing. It's the go to. We automatically default without even thinking about it. Oh, how do we deal with that? We should do this. You should do that. Individuals need to do this. Um, this is the individualization of responsibility. It's the individualization of our environmental problems. It defines them as individuals consume this, they waste this, therefore they should not, right? You, 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 individuals. We're the problem, therefore we're the solution. This is the default, the go-to. There are problems with this. It's a problem to default to the individual. One, it makes the problem seem bigger and harder to solve. Right. How, if unless everyone changes, nothing will change and that's never going to happen. So how the fuck are we going to solve this? Right. That's one issue. Another is the focus on the individual misses most of the problem in many cases. Let's talk about the framing of problems and the importance of context for just a minute. Um, the way you frame the problem will influence how you propose to solve it. So if you are not getting the frame up, right if you are not getting the context right um the solutions you come up with are are basically worthless right because you're not actually understanding the problem um and so this con this example comes from something called frameworks training and it's about getting context into the initial definition of the problem if you actually want to come up with solutions context is one of the most difficult elements of the frame to describe and one of the most important to get right. So from the frameworks training, we explain context by first showing the group a picture of cows. You guys can see that on the slide. They're chewing grass in a field. We explain some of the cows are getting sick and then ask the group why, um, what, do you, what might be the cause, speculate it. And so you should do the same. Um, you guys are in sustainability, so you're already pretty smart. So you might be a little bit ahead of the game, but just a couple of guesses. Why might these cows be sick? Um, maybe the feed's contaminated. Maybe one of the cows are sick. Maybe the farmer doesn't know what they're doing. Um, and these are sort of the answers that people give. Um, invariably, people work within the frame that has been given to them. They ask if the farmer gave the cows bad feed or if the farmer is inexperienced or if the cows have wandered into an adjacent field or if the cows caught a disease from other cows. Then in the training, they add a backdrop that shows an urban landscape with smokestacks and fumes belching just over the cow's heads. With the context, the framing added, then they ask the question again, why do you think the cows are getting sick? This time, the participants are able to broaden the scope of their speculation to include environmental causes. And they start asking about the relationship of the cows to the urban environment, to the air, the water, the soil. Um, it brings home the important importance of getting context into the initial definition of the problem. Right? Context provides more than just details. Um, it focuses on issues and trends that are common to groups. And to identify trends requires systems level thinking. Bear with me. Okay, so this 
This means you have to be strategic in, in, in identifying the problem you want to communicate. Um, for example, the way you identify the problem makes all the difference in how people are able to view your solutions. When people understand issues as individual problems, they may feel critical or compassionate, but they won't see policies and programs as the solutions. For example, the dominant frame for children's issues is a needy child and a parent. And this two person frame sets up the idea that the parent and the parent alone is responsible for the child's needs. However, if you provide context and broaden the frame to include other parents, the community, education, the teacher, business leaders, the mayor, uh, the neighborhood that people live in, st structural racism, uh, you define the problem as public in nature and expand the possibilities for solving it, right? Systems level thinking forces us to view not the cows within this narrow frame of just the field and the farmer, but it gives us more options, the context, uh, more options for defining the problem and therefore creating appropriate solutions. Um, without systems level thinking, without this context, this broader framing, we're forced into narrow solutions, right? Um, we don't have enough recycling. Oh, you should recycle more. Um, this ignores the broader context of lobbying and policies and large, powerful corporations that attack bills and regulations that would require them to be more responsible about their plastic use. Um, they pass it right on to the consumer. So narrow solutions to broad, complex problems, these are not solutions at all. Right? You have to get the context right. You've got to get the framing right. How we frame the problem shapes the solutions that people will develop. If you are not framing the problem accurately, there is no point in the solutions you come up with. And so recall this individual focus, the default go-to for solving our environmental problems. What can you do? What can we as individuals do? This misses the context, the, the majority of the framing of how our environmental problems are actually created. And the majority of these problems are caused by these larger structural and organizational factors, not individuals. These structural factors are disproportionately more important. They're harder to see, as we've been discussing, but again, generally far more important. And the question becomes not what should I do, but what are things that we can do to stop organizations from harming the earth? How do we address this on a policy, on a structural level to have a larger impact? Um, another example of the default frame, 101 ways to you to save the earth, right? That you can. Um, this is the individualization of environmental problems. It's, it's, rife throughout our culture. It's all over the place. Start looking around. On the on the chart, uh, plastic bottle waste tripled since 1995. And so if you look at the graph, um, the sort of white or solid color, not black bar, that's sales, water bottle sales. The black is waste, which is on the rise. Sales are on the rise. And the sort of um, dotted or, or striped bars or recycling, which you can see is stagnant, um, really hasn't increased despite increased sales and increased use. Um, and so profits continue to soar. Recycling hasn't gone up despite increased advertising. And so the title of the, the results of the study, right, the group, the study group, this think tank, because of these results, asks the consumer to be more responsible about recycling. Oh, we have a lot of waste. What's the solution? Consumers should be more responsible. This is the individualization of responsibility, right? Please, please recycle. Please recycle. Uh, start looking around for this. It's not it's not just recycling. It's everything. Look, by buying this product, has anyone actually been to the Crystal Geyser um, bottled at the source plant? It's in the middle of the desert on 395. It's pretty funny. Um, also, you're not just saving the environment by recycling. By buying this product, you're also contributing to uh, sustainability of our forests.
right? Because Crystal Geyser is also a sponsor of American Forest. So by buying this product, you're really doing your part, right? Recycle, this company contributes to forests. Um, if you buy their product, you're doing your part in terms of forest conservation. You're a sustainable individual consumer. And you probably feel just a little bit better buying a product like this versus another one that doesn't care about the environment as much. Um, individuals should be more responsible. And so back to our graph, group asks consumers to be more responsible about recycling. What would be a more organizational message that doesn't focus on individuals, but focuses on the broader structural issues, the, which is the bigger barrier to sustainability? Um, a more organizational message might be, instead of asking individuals to be more responsible and recycle, um, the group could maybe call on Coke and Pepsi, which are multi-billion dollar industries, to stop attacking bottle bills that would regulate their use of plastic and their resource use. Um, and so there's legislation, there's people trying to deal with these issues, trying to restrict plastic use, or at least make these companies pay for it. Um, Coke, Pepsi, large-scale organizations spend millions, if not billions of dollars lobbying Congress, funding political leaders' campaigns, um, doing everything they can to make sure that this legislation that would require them to be more environmentally responsible never makes it through. Um, they stomp out these proposals before they, the public even knows about them. Companies like Coke and Pepsi say, oh, you can't, you can't pass that cost on to us. We can't be more environmentally responsible. That's very anti-business. That will cost jobs, right? This is the common discourse. I mean, it's bullshit. Remember the two big drawbacks of the individual focus. It makes the problem seem bigger and harder to solve. How are we ever going to get everyone to recycle, right? I, where I live, I don't even have recycling. My, my, shithole landlords won't pay for it even though they're gentrifying the whole building. Um, I collect my recycling in big bags and then take it somewhere, right? I don't even have access to it. Um, how is everyone going to recycle? That's never going to happen, right? It makes the problem seem bigger, harder to solve. It makes it almost seem impossible. Why even try? Um, the facts, the statistics can make our eyes just glaze over. It conveys, you know, this is a huge problem. What are we going to do? How can individuals solve this? And also, um, this focus on individuals also paints this picture of, well, you know, the problem isn't me. I'm doing what I should be doing. It's just other people are being irresponsible. So many issues, so many drawbacks with the focus on the individual. And most importantly, the individual focus, this default, this go to this emphasis on what we can do, what you can do, it misses most of the problems. It misses the majority of what causes our environmental issues. Um, it keeps our focus on individuals and it takes our eye off the bigger part of the problem. It takes our eye off the ball, which are these structural organizational factors. Um, let's bring it back to water. So water, we have a water problem. What do we do? Use less, reduce your use, get rid of your lawn, take a shorter shower. The individual focus misses most of the problem because it misses most of what causes and consumes our water. So water consumed by the average American, um, as water, as liquids, just drinking um, three to five liters maybe per day, if you're fairly well hydrated. As food, people eat, consume maybe three to 5,000 liters per day. On average, um, meat eaters consume a lot more. Again, all the energy and food and water that goes into raising the animal, about 90% of that is lost due to trophic levels. So it's just high, much more consumptive. Um, so in water and food, um, how many gallons, for example, just to make a hamburger, like the, the patty, the bun, the lettuce, um, maybe a little piece of tomato. Um, what do you think? How many gallons to make one quarter pounder hamburger? Uh, estimates vary. Some are much higher than this. But according to one estimate, almost 700 gallons just to make a hamburger. Right. If you look at sort of each piece of the burger, um, the bun is 11 gallons of water. That's half the bun, actually. So like 22 gallons altogether. Um, lettuce takes about 1.5 gallons. The tomato, three cheese, 56 gallons. And then the patty, the little quarter pound of meat, 616 gallons. Right. Again, meat eaters consume way more water than non meat eaters um, because of trophic levels. 
And this could potentially be an underestimate. Um, more recent estimates, uh, David Pimentel from Cornell, 3,000 gallons for a quarter pounder. So again, this isn't by any means the highest estimate I could have chosen. And we don't see this, we don't see how much water goes into a quarter pounder because it's not priced into the cost, right? The cost of water is subsidized. If companies had to pay the actual cost of producing this, we as consumers would either pay much higher prices for our quarter pounders, or we wouldn't pay it at all because it's too expensive and companies would either go out of business or change their practices. <clears throat> Just real quick, if you look at the different components of the burger, look at the lettuce and the tomato, which actually like I think of requiring water to grow these foods, these vegetables or fruits out of the ground. Um, that uses the least water out of all the components. The cheese and the patty are the most because these are animal products. And then think of look at the bun, the bun, um, you know, 10, 10 times as much as the lettuce um, because it's processed food. Right. So the animal products and the processed food, so much water, fossil fuels, energy and waste go into creating this this stuff. There's also so that's water used, um, what we drink and as water, what we eat as food. And then also just in terms of urban use, there's also plenty of water waste. Um, individuals waste water. Right. Uh, look at how much goes to landscape and watering, like 55 percent. Um, that's so that's a huge chunk that's kind of changing as people change their landscape um, showers and baths toilets faucets clothes washing dishwashing it looks like people don't really wash their dishes other and then look three percent just for leaks just for inefficiencies in the system um, and again look at that landscape watering keep that in mind for our next lecture on green lawns and suburbia where does that come from why the fuck do we have lawns like seriously where, where does that come from um, okay, so urban users waste plenty of water, but are they really the culprits of our dwindling resources? And the answer is no. Over 80% of all of California's water goes to agriculture. Um, this is 2005. That number has not gone down. If anything, it's a little bit higher. That red slice of the pie, that 20% that goes to urban usage, that's not just individuals and household use. That's industrial. That's commercial use. That's everything but agriculture um outside of california in arizona which is if you've ever been a desert if you will it's warm um 87 of the water in arizona goes to agriculture um it's pretty much just as high in colorado and new mexico and in nevada nearly a hundred percent of all consumptive water use meaning sort of everything except for the recycled water goes to agriculture um, and again, I grew up in Nevada. We, the focus all my life, we have certain days you can water your plants. You can get fined uh, if you if you water your lawn on the wrong day. Once once my I take over that house, my parents' lawn is going to be gone anyways. Um, but literally, water is so important that you're only allowed to water your plants on these days. You will be fined if you water outside of those days. Yet 100% of the water in Nevada is actually going to agriculture. So these regulations, this focus on limiting individual use, fine. I'm not saying it doesn't have an impact. It misses almost all of the problem. And another reason that this is happening is that people using most of the water aren't actually paying for it. So don't get bogged down in the numbers here, but I want to illustrate to you um, how much water is being used and how much it's not being paid for. This incentivizes waste. Um, so the, in the Central Valley, which includes Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley, this is, again, the most productive agricultural region in the world. And it has a climate that's drier than northern Africa. It's drier than the Sahel fucking desert. How is this area so productive then? Um, the answer is perverse subsidies. The government foots the water bill. And by the government, I mean you, the taxpayer. Um, same as industrial food production, right? The way that corn is subsidized. Just to read, in 2002, the largest 10% of farms got 67% of the water for an average subsidy of worth about 350,000. 27 large farms receive subsidies, each worth 1 million or more, compared to a median subsidy for all recipients of about 7,000. One farm, Wolf Enterprises of Huron, Fresno County, received more water by itself than 70 CVP water user districts. One farm got more water on its own than 70 Central Valley project water user districts. So that's 70 
districts that use Central Valley Project water. One farm got more than all 70 districts for a subsidy worth uh, about $4 million. So what you're seeing um, in 2002, 10%, only 10% of the farms got about two thirds of the subsidy, 67% of all the water. Our tax money pays for this. And so the average subsidy was 349,000, meaning the average farm got that amount, but the median subsidy for each farm was only about 7,000. This is an important distinction. What you're seeing is a few really large farms got giant subsidies in the millions. The majority of people got very little. This drags the average up, right? It drags it up towards the high end, even though the majority of people aren't really represented by this number. So the median is a much better measure of the average subsidy people got. Um, or, or the amount most people really received. And if you look at the median subsidy, it's only about $7,000. So it's the, it's the super large, already wealthy farms that are getting the subsidies, not the small farmer that's getting the help. Uh, 27 big farms received 1 million each, right? It's giant corporations are reaping the benefits of these tax dollar subsidies, not the small farmer. Okay, a few more things. Um, back to our cost comparison. So remember, bottled water, $11 will get you a gallon in the store. Um, if we look at residential rates, $11 will get you 1,100 gallons in Santa Fe. $11 will get you almost 2,000, about 1,800 gallons in San Diego. If you go to Central Valley, the Central Valley Water Project, the, uh, the people that use this irrigation water, $17 will get you one acre foot of water. That's a lot. One acre foot equals 325,851 gallons. An acre foot is equal to the amount of water you need to cover an acre of land by the depth of one foot. That's about 326,000 gallons. Um, this one acre foot is about the amount of water used by an average family of four for a whole year. So, uh, Central Valley Project water users, the large farms, they pay about $17 per acre foot, the amount of water an entire family will use during one year. This works out to about $1 per 19,000 gallons. Um, and so $11 of Central Valley Water Project water, $11 will get you a gallon in the store, it'll get you about 2,000 gallons of residential water in San Diego. $11 in Central Valley, if you're a large farm, will get you over 200,000 gallons of water. Um, the bottom line is that farmers that are using Central Valley Project water, they're getting it at artificially cheap prices. They're not paying the full cost and they're not paying anything for the infrastructure, or the energy or the costs associated with actually transferring the water. So the individual focus misses most of the problem and most of the causes. Water consumed by the average American, again, three to five liters as, a, as liquids, maybe 3,000 to 5,000 liters as food, meat eaters consuming much more than others. But yet 80% of the water in California goes to agriculture. And remember this discourse that, oh, we can't, we can't do anything to deal with the water problem because that'll cause economic harm, job loss. This agriculture that's supported by subsidized water in the Central Valley and in California, this is only about two to three percent of our state economy. Um, so arguments that any sort of change to this subsidy structure would just destroy the economy, these are so overstated. It's only two to three percent of our economy. That's sort of true statewide and also nationwide, anywhere from one to three percent of the GDP in any given year. Um, it's just not that big of part of our economy, but we spend so much money subsidizing a handful of large producers. Um, so much money essentially allowing a few people to reap major benefits um, while the broader society and environment continues to bear the costs. Um, it's, I'm not saying these jobs don't matter. I'm not saying that this agricultural production doesn't matter. It does, um, or that we don't care or that we're heartless about it. What I'm saying is arguments about this being vital to the economy, we can't change anything because it'll destroy jobs and people, is bullshit. It's so overstated. It's not vital to the economy. How much money are we spending subsidizing people in Iowa and Idaho to not grow fruits and vegetables, but to grow corn and soy for our processed unhealthy foods? We are literally paying them in the, in the East 
to not grow healthy food. And then we're spending all this water to be able to grow fruits and vegetables in the Central Valley where we don't have any water. I mean, the way we have set it up, the subsidies, is ju it's backwards. It incentivizes waste, um, not sustainability. Over half of the subsidies that support agriculture go to low value crops, things that don't really make much of a return, that are not vital to the economy. Things like alfalfa, hay, rice, cotton. Most of this goes to feed animals. Um, of all the subsidies that, the agri that support agriculture, that amounts to only about 17% of the agricultural income. 17% of farmers' income is supported by these millions and billions of dollars of subsidies. Um, so it actually creates very, very few jobs. Um, again, arguments, this discourse that environmental actions will destroy the economy, it's bullshit. It, it's based off assumptions. It's a discourse. It's a taken for granted assumption. Think that you could make a very reasonable argument in the opposite vein, right? That actually changing things, we could create jobs. Um, you know, it's about people's values. What kind of world do you want to live in? If you look at the graph, um, the chart shows economic sector. So like rice growers, cotton, almond, total agriculture, fruits and veggies, um, onto petroleum schools, uh, down towards the bottom, total industrial. And then it shows, so for each sector, like how much water is required, um, and then how many jobs are produced relative to how much water is used. So in rice, for example, for each thousand acre feet of water, produces one job. Remember one acre foot is 326,000 gallons. So a thousand acre feet, that's roughly 326 million gallons for one job. Cotton, three jobs. Almond, six jobs. Look at schools that produces over a thousand jobs or retail stores over 10,000 jobs per thousand acre foot. Um, so again, this argument that it's it will decimate the economy if we change the way we're doing things, it's just not empirically supported. This is the same thing, this graph, just uh, visually a little more pleasing to you. Um, California jobs created per thousand acre foot of water used. And again, um, almost no jobs are created from this. So where is all the water going? Um, economic growth is up. If you look at gross state product, the blue line, that's been trending up. Uh, population growth is slightly increasing, trending up that red middle line. But if you look at water withdrawal, that's actually down. Um, water withdrawal, relatively stable at least. It's not increasing. And if you look at per capita water use, how much is our individual Californians using, we're using less and less. This has actually declined. So population's up, economic growth's up, individual water use is down, yet Lake Mead, like Lake Mead continues to hit new historic lows. Where is all the water actually going? And again, it's going to agriculture. And it's subsidized, so the people using it aren't really paying for it. And therefore, there's no incentive to actually be responsible or conserve it. Um, this shows several billions in subsidy payments from like 1995 to 2009. Don't get bogged down again in the numbers. It's just to show you where the money is going. If you look at the bottom bar in the bar chart, um, commodity subsidies. Most of the money goes to commodities, things like rice, soy, hay, not fruits and vegetables, not the kind of food that's good for us. Um, and so from this time period, 91% of farms in California didn't even collect a subsidy. Um, that's according to the USDA, right? So over 90% aren't even getting any of this money. Of those that did collect subsidy payments, the top 10%, only about 10% of farms collected over three quarters of the subsidy, 73%, um, for a total of almost $6 billion over 16 years. Of the top 10% that collected, so 10% so out of everyone collected most of the subsidies. Out of that small proportion, the top 10% of them got an average subsidy of about $66,000 per year through this time period. It's not bad. That's more than I make in a year by two or three times. Um, and then out of that small, small group that actually got any money, the bottom 80% of that, the average subsidy was like $1,400. So on the one hand, one, one group's getting you know, 66,000, um, the re everyone else is getting 1,400. Um, the money, again, the subsidies, they're not saving the small farmer. They're not bringing widespread benefits. They're highly concentrated, the benefits, and mostly along large profitable farms, not the people that actually need monetary assistance. And so this is a concept of a perverse subsidy. 
Um, subsidy is monetary assistance granted by the government to bring about desirable outcomes. Like for example, the farm bill was initially designed to keep farmers whole during lean years so that if they couldn't sell their crops because the market sucked, the prices had collapsed, the farm bill was designed to sort of help them out during that time so that they wouldn't go out of business so that during other years when we need them growing food, we'd still have them. Uh, that became perverse over time for reasons we've talked about. Basically, powerful individuals played a role in shaping those policies to their benefit, right, for profits for a handful of people. And so same idea with water. Um, the subsidy was initially designed to sort of help out those with needs, but over time it's become perverse. So just from this study, uh, while commodity crop subsidies continue unabated, more pressing priorities like providing healthy school lunches and funding programs that help farmers prevent pesticides and other contaminants from getting into drinking water and protect wildlife habitats, these all go unaddressed. Worse, the fresh fruits and vegetables necessary to combat the growing childhood obesity epidemic receive a pittance in government support compared to the billions handed out to support just five commodity crops. Um, we're subsidizing commodity crops, the stuff that doesn't really provide jobs, the stuff that doesn't really feed us. Um, it does create soaring profits for a small handful of people. And so again, a subsidy is monetary assistance granted by the government. Perverse subsidies um, are government payments that encourage undesirable outcomes. So like corn subsidies that benefit Cargill and Monsanto and Tyson Chicken, but not the taxpayer or the farmer or the consumer. Um, water subsidies that benefit the largest corporate farms, but not actually the small farmer or the environment or the economy. Remember, agriculture is two to three percent of the economy. I'm not saying we want it to fail, but economic arguments are way overstated in defense of these subsidies. And so if the cost incentivizes us to use it, right, we're, we're, it, like individuals have to actually pay for the water they use. And so we're often careful about wasting it. Um, yet large scale agriculture and essentially big business is encouraged to use as much water as they possibly can. In fact, if they don't use all of the water allotted to them by their subsidy each year, the next year they won't get the same subsidy. Um, need is identified based off use. So if they don't use all the water, it's considered that they don't need it and they'll actually receive less help. And so the incentive is even if you don't need it, use it. It just gets wasted. Um, and it costs them almost nothing, right? Because they're not really paying for it anyways. And so if we come back to our cost comparison one more time, um, bottled water, $11 will get you a gallon in the store. City water in San Diego, $11 residential rate will get you about 1,800 gallons. Um, San Diego agricultural water. In San Diego, we provide a small subsidy for our farmers so that water is a little bit cheaper for them to sort of help them out. So instead of $11 getting them 1,800 gallons, it'll get them about 2,900 gallons here. And also take a look at the picture of how San Diego agriculture is done. Central Valley agriculture, $11 gets you over 200,000 gallons. And take a look at the picture of how Central, Cal Central Valley irrigation is done, right? Um, look at the difference in planting between San Diego and Central Valley, right? It's, it's obvious Central Valley is not paying for their water. Otherwise they'd probably use it a little more efficiently, right? And so the full cost, has to actually show up in the price for consumers to make so-called rational choices, right? If these prices, these costs continue to be externalized, right? The true cost of water, um, the true cost of our carbon emissions, of plastic bags, um, we continue to not price these things into the actual cost of the products that we produce and consume, uh, we'll continue to get the same unsustainable outcomes. We have to start pricing these externalities in. Consumers will either pay more and then that money can be used to offset environmental issues um, because the producer will pass these costs on to the consumer or consumers will make different choices. They'll no longer support that business or that producer, forcing changes in practice or policy um, or new alternatives as old businesses go out of business because people aren't willing to pay that high price. Got to start pricing the true cost of our production into the price tag. Otherwise, how are we ever gonna make rational choices about what we should do, All right? Who's gonna waste more water?
sort of last point, um, are farmers, you know, on, on individual versus organizational factors, um, are farmers, farmers evil just trying to take all of our money? No, absolutely not. Uh, they're hardworking and pretty much across the board underpaid, right? Um, we're not talking about farmers in general. We're not talking about the family farm. Um, so no, we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is organized farm interests sometimes can create bad environmental outcomes. Um, and so which set of factors tends to be more powerful, right? Individual water use or individual actions or these organized organizational structural factors. And so that wraps things up for water. Where we're headed next week is automobility, highways, sprawl, and suburbia. Why are our cities set up this way? And is this inevitable? Or if not, could we be doing things differently? And we'll also get into alternatives. So for next lecture, you want to make sure you read um, Steinberg talking about um, lawns, and also suburban sprawl and how that came to be. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It was created for us. Um, all right, so with that, take care and I will see you next time. Only a couple more lectures left and one week left. You guys got this. See ya.